Hello, this is Alan Green. This is the second part of an ongoing series of interviews with Paul Jason, the motorcycle broker. In our last interview, we looked at several examples of classic motorcycles and the sort of returns investment grade machines have delivered over the past 10 to 20 years. Today, we take a look at the classic car market and see how some of the iconic cars from the past 70 years have performed as investments. We also ask whether classic motorcycle prices have kept pace with classic cars and whether a valuation gap exists between the two classes. Paul, it's good to speak with you again. Good morning, Alan. Good to speak to you again. So before we look in detail at the classic cars, I'm going to pick up where we left off last time with the slide that shows the return on investment on three classic Ducati motorcycles. In particular, the Carl Fogarty uh, Ducati has delivered a pretty impressive return. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, I've, I've tracked these since uh, about 2010. I've known one or two owners of these machines. There are only four in the world from the 1994 which, uh, uh, season, which is absolutely iconic. Um, and it went on to tell another great story con continuously in World Superbike until about 1999, 2000, around then. And its racing success is legendary. Um, it's the stuff of myths and legends in the same way uh, that Barry Sheen was just mm. prior in the 70s. My hero. Yeah. And, you know, Carl Fogarty, he's now a celebrity. He's on, he was on, wait, one, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Um, and more and more people, his profile's being raised. But people always look over their shoulder at World Superbike and, Ducati's dominance in it through the 90s and to be able to get your hands on a machine like that is there's very there's just very few of them there they, they, they just don't exist there's lots of fakes lots of forgeries lots of claims that people have got them but they have to be verified it has to be a verified motorcycle and we're only dealing with the verified motorcycles here yeah, OK. There, there is, of course, a great deal of disparity in the sales data from auction houses, auction websites, dealers, and, of course, private sales. But um, Blue-Blooded Blue Blank Coots uh, established a passion index some years ago, and they recently published some data on classic car prices in comparison to such classes as wine, art, jewellery, coins, and, and so on. So this is this makes really interesting reading because it does, I think, place a benchmark on uh, classic car and classic vehicle performances. Yeah. Um, I mean, really, since I guess it's the early 2000s, it is the early 2000s. Um, people in Britain and, and, and then later in the rest of Europe um, have been getting into tangible assets and then that really kicked off from 2007 eight when you had the crash mm. it really firmed up that this was wise to do because that was when the big money printing began and yeah. you can't make more of a particular classic car you even if you 3d printed the things they wouldn't have the correct engine and chassis numbers so those are unique and it's the same with all of these things these watches they, you know, they made so many of them. That's it. When they finish making that, you can't go and you're just left in the used market. And they seem to grow in value um, as time goes on in the same way art does. There's only so many Picassos. Uh, there's only so many paintings that Picasso painted and pieces of artwork that he created. And it's the same for all artists. So, and our art, people have been investing in it um, for hundreds of years. It's a, a very old investment. So there's no real difference between, in, in principle, between art, coins, classic cars, fine wine, whiskies, watches, and, of course, classic motorcycles. It's just that they've been 
a lot more under the radar and they're starting to break cover now and people are turning to them. We are getting so many inquiries from classic car owners and property owners as well, people who have taken their money out of property and are looking for another safe haven. It's safe haven investing with an element of fun. Yeah, and you made a very good point, of course, after the credit crunch in 2007, uh, uh, people looking for returns on their cash were really struggling to find any sort of return from the banks. And, um, of course, alternative assets like this really came into their own. Yeah. So just on this, while we're on these vehicles, let's take a look at some of these wonderful cars and bikes. So, of course, we've got here... Um, uh, well, th th these, of course, th these are your bikes, Paul. So you you'll know all about these. Um, can you just run us through the uh, through through the through the uh, bikes again? Okay, as you look at the screen, the top left hand red Ducati is a Series One um, factory replica nine nine six SP. Britain had its own version called the Foggy Rep, the Fo uh, Carl Fogarty replica. They made two hundred and two of those, but it was only released in Britain, so it's not really a global motorcycle. It's only for people in Britain. But the Series 1 factory replica, they made even less. They made 150 of those. And they were released globally. And they're known about globally. So there's less of them, but there's a much bigger market. So the prices are going to go a lot higher on that 996 SPS factory replica series one um, in the middle on the top you've got the Ferrari GTO the I'm last one that. that we know that sold sold off market for 75 million dollars in I think 2019 or 2018 there's an amazing story uh, uh, behind that car Nick Mason the drummer of Pink Floyd of yeah. course bought a 250 GTO in the 70s and in the 80s, when the two key uh, members of Pink Floyd split, that's David Gilmore and Roger Waters, David Gilmore took Pink Floyd on the road with the with a huge stadium tour. Um, and uh, the financiers required that tour to be underwritten. So Nick Mason put forward his 250 GTO as security for the, uh, for the tour. And of course, as we now know, it's a fantastic success. But I think that's a lovely story. And... Of course, Nick Mason is well known for his love of classic cars and his um, and his uh, his collection. He's also known for probably knowing something that other people don't, because I remember as a kid hearing stories about when he bought that car. And uh, one of my brother's best friends, his father um, was kind of like the Har another Harvey Goldsmith. He bought over a lot of um Bands. He brought over Ike and Tina Turner, Santana. And I remember he they were saying he was mad and bonkers for buying that car. £35,000, you could buy a four or five bedroom house in Wimbledon for that at that time. What's he doing spending it on a car? And four or five bedroom house in Wimbledon today, probably what's that worth? Two, three million? Two and a half, three million, easily, yeah. And... Lo and behold, $75 million for his yeah. car. I know which I would have rather bought. And he said, just watch me. Apparently, he, and he, I remember this guy saying, he was like, I don't get it. He's saying, just watch me. He's, he's bought a car when he could buy a house. What's mad? He's mad. You can't rent a car out. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, you know, lo and behold. He was absolutely, absolutely on the money with that. He's a, a great foresight, great foresight. And of course, we've got the Alpha, the Alpha Eight C there uh, below the Ferrari. Yeah. Now the Alpha Eight C has gone up immensely. They're about twenty million dollars now, um, and there is a link between that and a particular motorcycle, the MV Agusta Seven Fifty S. That Eight C. Uh, has gone up from, I think, around 2004, one and a half million pounds to around $20 million today. That's one hell of a return. And I recently uh, did an interview with the author Ian Falloon, 
which is going to come out soon, where we talk a lot about the Alpha 8C and its links with the MV Augusta 750S, where the MV Augusta 750S is nearly half an 8C motor in a bike. So that, it, it's a really, really uh, undervalued machine. And there's a lot of smart money going after these Alpha Arts 8Cs. Mm. I think we're going to see a lot more increases in prices in the coming decades. Uh, decade or two, you're going to see them really, really move. Um, yeah. Yeah. And of course, also in the slide, we've got the Bruff Superior and the Ducati 750 SS green frame. Yes, the top right hand one on your frame, the uh, silver and green Ducati, that was a one year only model, the 1974 750 SS known as the green frame. They built 401 of them, and it's an amazing motorcycle. Right now, you're looking at well over 150,000 for one. I have seen unrestored ones go for 300,000 plus. Um, those bikes were 40,000 pounds in 2010. Yeah. That's an incredible uh, upward force on prices, but they yeah. haven't begun to take off yet there's a lot there um the bottom left hand slide is a bruff superior and it is a this is a nice under the radar one which we'll talk about later that's an 1150 ss 100 uh it was an 1100 cc motor and it was a side valve and it was one of the best motorcycles they made and that's quite an undervalued bruff but the overhead valve bruffs um the the other ss hundreds with the thousand cc motors are now fetching three hundred and fifty thousand plus for investment grade ones and going up and i know of owners globally who are asking a lot more for them and they're getting that so they're heading towards half a million pounds okay well, we've got we've got some more cars and bikes here of course we've got um so the uh oh, actually the um the alpha 8c is still there in the middle so we've talked about that and of course the green frame and the bruff but let's uh just look at the we've got the aston martin db4 here paul and the the vincent black lightning yeah i mean that db4 is you just look at it and i think yeah. It's the type of car that Enzo Ferrari wished he had built. Every um, boy's dream. It is every boy's dream. You've got the 007 connection. Um, and those those years of Aston's are absolutely glorious. I mean, it just it, it oozes something special. And I remember going in one in the 1970s as a boy. Um, a friend of my family had one and you just got in this car and went wow this is special and then he started the engine and the roar it just excited me i was i was into anything that goes when i was a kid and i remember very well going in it i think it was a db5 um and being in the back seat and being absolutely blown away with it yeah. and then on the top left slide you've got a vincent black lightning these have kicked on hugely and the vincents are they're one of the few british bikes because the demographics are changing a lot of the people that own british bikes are dying now so there's yeah. less people mm -hmm. for them. um so triumph bonnevilles and norton commandos aren't a great investment at all there's millions of them and there's less and less people every day but the vincents and the bruffs have sat up like the um, flying truck Bentleys, the supercharged Bentleys of the 1920s and 30s um, as standout investment, uh, investments. So, you know, people will always go for the Vincents and Bruffs. If you want to invest in British motorcycles, those are the ones to go for and they will continue to go up. So that Black Lightning is something else. and. Yeah. They're amazing. Course, there's, that, there's that famous uh, picture or the poster from, I think it's the 50s. Uh, the uh, American rider Roly Free um, was pictured naked apart from a swimming cap and a pair of swimming trunks on the Bonneville salt flats. 
trying to well he set a speed record then of 150 miles an hour which uh wearing nothing but swimming trunks is probably the bravest thing anyone could ever do or the stupidest of course yeah it depends if you stay on the bike or not he stayed on the bike though it's bravest and yes come off would have been the stupidest stupidest and a very long painful death because it would have ripped his skin off and rubbed salt in the wounds and he yeah. would have a long time to die from scepticemia. Yeah. So, you know, uh, but he stayed on, so he's the hero. Um, and yeah, it's an iconic picture. And you just sort of, I, I remember as a kid seeing that and going like, what's he doing in his pants? <laughs> and he, he just looked and went, well, if I get rid of my clothing, I can get an extra couple of mile an hour. And, and he lay on the bike as well. Yeah. He actually had his feet hanging off the back, hanging off over the rear. I mean, yeah. but but it was it was one of those posters that captured a generation, it, and it, it of course it immortalised the Vincent. Um, and of course, one of the one of the Vincents that was involved in the land speed record attempt sold at Bonhams uh, last in two thousand eighteen, I think, for um, eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand. Yeah, I, I think it was in the nine hundred thousand. So. Yeah. 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 It's a huge amount of money and mm. it's a great story and it tells you something you know when people buy into this they're buying into a story there are you become a guardian of history when you own such a vehicle and um it's going to be very interesting when electrification comes in because it's just going to boost values hugely because everyone will miss the roar and the sensations of an in, of an internal combustion engine. So, I think you're going to, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be another huge price hike, and of course you've got China coming to market. That's going to be even more demand, and you're going to see these values go up and up and up. The classic car market has taken a breather, but it's had, you know, over 15 years of price yeah. increases. Nothing just goes up like that and carries on going up. It does have to plateau, and that's what it's doing. Sure. Well, of course, the, the passion index provides a general benchmark for growth and value. But within this, there have been some spectacular returns from some of those rare and desirable cars we just looked at, along with the bikes. So I've got here a slide that looks at the percentage returns over the past 15 years. So, of course, we can see the GTO. Uh, the GTO, the Alfa Romeo 8C and 6Cs on the left. Um, these are percentage returns since 2007. And then, of course, we've got the bikes on the right. So can you can you take us through these, Paul? Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> – you can – these bikes are performing very well. Yeah, uh, they are. The cars, I mean, what – I can't. I can't think of very much unless you really got it right with investing in Apple at the right moment. Mm. Um, I can't think of much that would ever give you this kind of return. And there are people who can predict it because they're heavily ensconced in the market and they know what's going to go up, and they know why. They know how many were built. They know how many people had licenses for these things at that time. They understand the demographic push, and they understand the story, and they understand the reality behind each of these machines. And that's what it's about. And it does look like um, witchcraft, but it isn't. It's just knowledge. Uh, and it's I just think it's rarity, as you say, isn't it? If you look at the Ducati Foggy Race Bike, up 2,300%, the yeah. 70 SS Green Frame, of course, these are rare bikes. There are only a few of them around. Uh, yeah. And the prop, of course, has performed very well as well. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it's, I think it's the, the key to all of this is the rarity. So if there's something of which there are only one or two out there, then... Uh, you know, the, the, the message here does seem to be that rarity is, rarity is the key. Oh, rarity is definitely the driver, you know, because they made some really great cars and some really great bikes in huge numbers, mm. but they're not overly collectible. You can fall over them everywhere. And it's interesting. The Bruff is a very good pointer. It gives you an idea of how things are going to go. 
but you have to be able to compare other machines to the Bruff. And the rarity, I mean, they made more than 10 times as many Bruffs as they did Ducati green frames. They made more Bruff superiors and many more Vincents than they did 916 SPs and 996 SPs put together over nearly a decade. So um, you, you realize that some of these very, very rare machines are sort of lurking in the wings and ready to break cover and, and deliver massive profits. And there is a science behind this and you have to understand it really well. And you then need to understand the machines because you can be sold a very pretty pile of nuts and bolts that you think looks right and you you will absolutely get skinned because if it's not right it's not right yeah. And, yeah. you know and also a lot of people have a problem of these things can become black holes you throw money into and yeah they can if they're not set up correctly and very few people know how to set these things up well, of course, we can see on there the Honda CBX thousand as well. That's just starting. The valuations are nowhere near, of course, the uh, Black Lightning foggy race bikes or or the Bruffs or the green frames. But they're starting to move to move forward. I mean, they're up four hundred percent in the past fifteen years, which is still a pretty good return by any yeah. standards. Yeah, and uh, you know the the um, CBX uh, it, it's going to go to six figures. They're going to be a hundred thousand and. It wouldn't surprise me if it did it in five years. I'm not saying it will do it in five years. But what I am saying is that if it did, I wouldn't be at all surprised. And they, they are they're very, very difficult to find. Yeah. They made, um, we, I crunched some numbers with some people in the know. They made uh, 24,000 of them. But there's actually about, 5,000 investment grade worldwide. Of those, over half of them will need restoring. Now, if somebody gives me a CBX 1,000 and says, can you restore it, it'll cost them 30,000 pounds, depending on what they bought. That's, that's the minimum that it's going to cost them. So they're, they're hugely undervalued. And those restoration costs are only going to go up. They're yeah. very, very expensive to get involved with, yeah. uh, you know, and you, you've had experience with these. People are chucking a thousand pounds just for getting their carburetors source, sorted <laughs> and they're still not sorted. Um, mm. And, you know, we're, we're having to charge 1500 to sort people's carburetors out if they need stripping down into individual units. Um, well, well, uh, my CBX will be on its way down to you very soon. So, um, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to looking forward to the reset and riding it afterwards. It's a glorious bike to ride, and uh, but they, they're complicated engines, 24 valves, six cylinders, um, six carburetors, and if they ain't set up properly, they they're horrible to ride. Yeah, and if they've been neglected, that can cause massive problems with them. Um, yeah. If if you take the sump off and put an endoscope up there and find out it's been neglected. The cheapest option is to fully rebuild the engine, and it costs five thousand pounds to do that. That yeah. is my cost of building a CB of rebuilding a CBX engine, and that yeah. is the minimum. That's yeah. just minimum. so, you know, it can cost me as as the um, uh, uh, engineers that are doing it mm -hmm. in wages and parts over five thousand pounds. And that's if it's lucky when you get in there. It can cost me a lot more. And then we have to pay our wages and our bills and rent yeah. and rates and everything. So we have to have a margin on that. Um, so it's not been unknown for people to come away with a £10,000 bill to rebuild their motor. Yeah. So if we move on now, Paul, um, we've, we've looked at uh, classic bikes and the returns that they've delivered over the past 15 years some are hugely impressive but as we've also seen some are only just starting to appreciate in value but even so if we look at the actual sale prices of the cars they still dwarf the valuations of the motorcycles um so we, we can see of course the 250 gto sale price there um the the alpha 8 c's and, and the astons um in comparison to bikes so 
do you think there's a that there is a we're going to see a decade where bike prices start to catch up with classic cars Paul? they have to yeah i mean there will never there's less of a bike than there is of a car um so you know and but there's often nearly as much work in doing a bike as there is in a car mm. uh, uh, spraying a motorcycle is really difficult uh it is not like spraying a car there's yeah there's more of it to do but that actually makes it a lot easier to do a big area than it is to do a small area with lots of curves and trying to spray a motorcycle frame is a nightmare you've got to get into all the nooks and crannies with an airbrush yeah. um, otherwise you'll have dry patches and then of course it's going to rot out um so you know the the these machines i could see them going pro rata when you find out which bike is mimicking which car you know i i, I could see them easily making 50 60 percent of the value of the of the equivalent car but there's another angle to it in that they usually made the cars in greater numbers than the bikes because the era we're looking at they built very few of these machines hmm. but cars got a lot more preserved one they had less accidents two they didn't they just didn't get stolen as much as motorcycles. There was a big industry in motorcycle theft. Yeah. They didn't get um, raced. They didn't get cut up and made into choppers. And when a car engine blew up, they were usually rebuilt. Whereas with a bike, they would just go and buy another engine out of another bike. And that's the yeah. end of that bike. It's not investment grade anymore. So there's... You know, the, the motorcycles are a lot rarer and there's actually more and more and more people pouring into uh, more and more different investors coming into the market. So it could be that certain bikes pro rata become more expensive than the cars because they're just rarer. Um, you know, green frames, they made 401. There is a register of them which we have access to. And there's 120 investment grade ones left. So that gives you the burn rate on motorcycles. And some motorcycles burn at a higher rate than others. Mm. Um, and you can really see that these are really very, very rare machines. And as they're now becoming um, desirable as an investment asset, they're going to get snapped up more and more and they just won't, they just won't be on the market. And when they do come on, you will have... 30, 40 people bidding over one motorcycle. And so the prices will go astronomical. Yeah. But you can see how undervalued they are. Well, I, th I think this chart really shows that, doesn't it? Because it shows the relative sale prices compared to, you know, we picked out three cars, admittedly, the, the Ferrari, the Aston Martin, and the Alfa Romeo. And, of course, the in terms of pure hard cash, the, the cars are selling for enormous amounts of money but really the upward curve in in the bike prices has really happened towards you know the probably since uh, 2015 2016 onwards where whereas of course the cars were making progress long long before that yeah i mean it's actually really been kicking off on the bikes since about 2010 yeah um you know in very short periods of time you had bikes doubling in value but mm. for example you could buy a mint Ducati 916 SP for £5,000 back then. Yeah. And you could take your pick because it was just an old bike. And you would find them where someone had even kept them in their living room. So you pay 6000 instead. Yeah. And that's for a motorcycle, you know, that today is worth around 40000 Um, But it's still massively undervalued. I mean, the 916 SP is like the Ferrari of classic motorcycles the f40 it's like the ferrari f40 of classic motorcycles now the highest value one is is now about forty thousand, and you know the f40 is well over a million so if it went to 60 percent of the price of a, 
uh, an F40, or even 30%, it would be 300, over 300,000. And yet it's just 40,000 pounds. That's really undervalued. There's a, there's a lot of headroom in these machines. There is. And of course, going forward into this decade, we've got a, a whole group of machines that are potentially set to appreciate. We're going to look at this in a future episode in more detail. Um, and of course, there are a lot of machines out there that are potential dark horse investments. I'm just going to whet your appetite for the next episode now by bringing up one such example. Can you tell us about this bike, Paul? Yes. Um, Alan Milliard is a motorcycling legend. He has built a motorcycle around a Dodge Viper V10 motorcycle, uh, uh, sorry, a Dodge Viper V10 car engine. So it's an 800 brake horsepower motorcycle that he rides regularly. And what he did with this particular motorcycle, he's also, by the way, featured on Henry Cole's um, The Motorbike Show. And I think he's now doing Shed and Buried as well. So he featured on television a lot. And he's an incredible man. He, this Kawasaki, you'll notice it's got four exhausts, so it's a four cylinder. Well, that machine was made originally by Kawasaki as a six cylinder, sorry, as a three cylinder. 750 and alan cut the engine up and he made it a four cylinder 1000 cc 120 brake horsepower two stroke and it's phenomenal um there's very few of them in the world he very rarely sells them if he does he sells them through us he very rarely sells them and those machines and what he tries to make them look like is a factory prototype and it just looks like a standard um h2 kawasaki and it isn't it's this thousand cc four cylinder and that is the motorcycle kawasaki should have built i've got a road test coming out on it soon and the guy who bought it he's an investor and he said well i'll name my price and it's this if someone wants to buy it off me that's the price if not i'm really quite happy to keep it um i love it it's great and i'm quite happy to keep it and you know those machines, they're going to go into hundreds of thousands of pounds. There's no doubt about it. And Alan Milliard is amazing. He built his own six-cylinder 350cc uh, motor from scratch in his workshop. Uh, double over camshaft. It's like a, a mini CBX1000. And he built this thing and runs it at shows. Um, yeah. And, you know, this is all just with dead reckoning. There's no... Uh, computer aided design or anything else he just he just he's just a genius engineer but um well, well next time paul i'd love to talk more on this but uh, we're running short on time next time paul and i will be looking at other examples of the alan milliard dynasty and some of his other machines along with other ideas for more dark horse investments meanwhile paul jason the motorcycle broker thank you again for joining us today thanks a lot alan nice to see you again speak soon